Hey, Revenue Radio, it's Mary Grothy, and I am in a very sassy mood today. (laughs) I apologize in advance. You should see my hair. For those of you that are listening and not watching this on YouTube, like go to YouTube and look (laughs) at what what is this? I don't know what (laughs) happened this morning. I wanted to channel 1980, what, five is this, you think? Yeah, or early 90s. Early 90s. I'm not really sure what's going on. Yeah, I mean, this is what God gave me, which is super (laughs) interesting. So I think because... It is such a mess. I'm, it just automatically put me in a very sassy mood, which is fine because I think that makes for really good radio. <laughs> and there is no one better to record with me if I'm in a sassy mood. One of our fractional CROs, Stacey Taubman, is joining us this morning. Welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. And this is her first time on Revenue Radio, so she's probably like, great. If Mary's <laughs> opening up this way. What is going to happen in the next 20 minutes? No, it makes my job that much more fun <laughs> rather than okay. a scripted, boring conversation. We never know where we're going to go, right? Yeah, well, we don't do scripted or boring here. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> those, are, those are not part of my MO. Okay, we need to dive into fractional leadership today because I have the, the privilege, or I have had in, in past years, the privilege of doing business development for House of Revenue. And one of the bigger pieces that people are wondering, like, what is fractional versus a consultant? What is fractional versus us hiring? Yeah. Why fractional? There's pros and cons. People define fractional in so many <laughs> different ways. And so it's definitely one of those topics that I think, I mean, you were just sharing that you're having this conversation with your husband. Right? I the was this table, morning, like, actually. This morning. Yeah. <laughs> like, we were sort of arguing about the consultants versus fractional and what he thought versus what I thought. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely to each his own, I think, on their definition. Of course, we have one that we abide by with fractional and what that means for us. But interestingly, like certain size companies can leverage fractional. Yeah, Other size companies should probably not. Mm-hmm. They should go more of a consultant route or hire full time. Yeah. But talk to us about what you've seen in your experience. So you're a three-time founder, three-time CEO, you're you're a two-time CRO, yeah, and a former school teacher. So <laughs> you've got an interesting background. Talk to me about what you're seeing from your own experience and the entrepreneurs you've surrounded yourself with over the last umpteen years of what you see through that startup scale and really what happens when you feel a pivotal point between consultant fractional, where does it get leveraged? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the hardest thing about being an entrepreneur and starting a company is the skills that got you off the ground and got you to a certain point are not the skills you need to take it to the next level. It's kind of like an entrepreneurial catch 22. And not to say you can't gain those skills. I did, right? But you, it's very time consuming and you make costly mistakes because I have made them. I don't know if uh, you've made that. You've mm, made no mistakes, mm, right? A few. <laughs> so it's not that you can't can't gain that experience. But if you're really wanting to scale and grow your company, bringing in someone who's seasoned, someone who has that experience is a great way to escalate that. Yeah. But how do you afford them when you're a startup or or even second stage scale CEO, right? Like I've noticed that a lot of CEOs, that tipping point, they go from, especially in a services business, they go from like people are billable or they have a really clean PL. So right. you can see, okay, this is our margin. But when they get to the point where they add enough people, they have to do this thing called m- add a layer of middle level management, <laughs> right? Which That's usually costly. is just an expense to the organization, right? And it cuts through their profits and it's like, holy smokes. And that's usually <laughs> what happens. And then most of the time those managers aren't trained. No, there's, there's very minimal training for managers. So then it becomes a management nightmare to the Mm. upper level execs or the CEO. If if the CEO is just managing those people. So yeah, the answer would absolutely be hire a seasoned person. But here's the thing to your point, it's expensive and they may not have it. And when you're scaling a growing company, you can spend your money in so many different areas. And do you, you know, hiring someone seasoned is going to be quite costly. And do I want to put all of those resources just to that person. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think your model and a fractional executive model bodes well, right? Not only is it going to be a part-time position, so it's not going to be as costly. You don't have benefits, Mm -hmm. you know, and in some ways it's a try before you buy, right? There is research from Leadership IQ that shows 46% of the time when you hire, that person doesn't last more than 18 months, Yeah. That's a costly mistake for such an important position. And so when you can bring someone in fractionally and they're in the trenches with you and you get a sense of what, you know, their value and their abilities, I think that's a great way to start and get you to the next level. Mm -hmm. I couldn't agree more. This revenue radio podcast 
started a couple of years ago and I used to run it solo and it yeah. was like a personal story. I've seen and, a few of those episodes. It's and great. The business. <laughs> and then we split it off and I sure. took my personal journey onto Destination Remarkable and we've been super business in the last season on Revenue Radio, which is great. But for our longtime fan and audience, I know that they know, as I have so clearly outlined the struggles when sure. in 2021, it was like a weekly diary of us <laughs> building middle level management yeah. of me panicking sure. of what that was doing to our PNL of us actually hiring junior level people for the first time. And then underestimating yeah. the amount of training, mentorship, infrastructure, performance management, accountability, like Boy, what other <laughs> buzzwords are there in managing? You're needing standard ops. <laughs> I know, I know. And what's interesting is it was uh, a great way to scale because sure. we ourselves got up over 5 million and we had 28 people. So really tremendous feat. But how is your profit margin? Low. <laughs> the, you know, yeah. people focus on the revenue piece of things, which is so important. But at the end of the day, that's a vanity metric, right? People uh, grow at all costs. Uh, what, we did an are you episode. having PTSD? <laughs> yes, I'm shaking. Um, we had an episode called Obsession with Gromance. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because it was that. And right. I had executives that were just young, hungry, really excited to be part of something big. Yeah. I was like, uh, we're a hundred million dollar company. This is really but- <laughs> hard. It's really hard over a services company. We claim to do, you know, like really remarkable work and yeah. it takes a brilliant person to do that. So we changed right over the last year. Everyone knows us if they've been following along, but we went the seasoned mature route. Like we ponied up. We, that's why we, I'm here. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. We, we doubled our comp at the um, VP level, turned it into a C level role. And it's tremendous, right. uh, but the quality and caliber of who has mm-hmm. come to House of Revenue as a result of that. So translating that into a company who's it, at this stage, like they're plateaued. Sure. They need to scale revenue. It's very expensive. Very to expensive. hire a full-time person that's worth it. So what do they usually do? They hire like good enough of, or what they can get for what they can afford. Yeah. What, what happens with that? Well, that's again, often a costly mistake, it, not only in terms of the money outlaid, but your time, you know, and in my opinion, also more importantly, your reputation, not that those people can't learn the skills, but when they're learning and making mistakes, how is that working for your clients? And I'm not willing to take that chance. I want to make sure that we can deliver every single time and that we're over delivering. Yeah. A lot of our clients that when we're in business development conversations with them, they explain, Hey, we wanted to grow. So we hired a VP of sales. Well, that <laughs> VP of sales wasn't cheap, but this whole 46% stat yeah. that in 18 months. So yeah, it's usually 12 to 18 months. We're getting the call and it's like, well, they didn't work out <laughs> well. And actually what's really interesting now is three, maybe of the last four or five calls that I've had with CEOs, their CRO hasn't worked out. It yeah. used to always be the VP of sales or I'd hear, you know, I had a marketing position turned and now I'm shocked that the CRO role is really catching that much steam. And they are like, well, we hired a CRO. We made a huge investment. We are like, this is it. We're going to really skip. They didn't work out. <laughs> and we have so much on that topic on I a know. different episode. But so talk to me about this like try before you buy thing. Like you mentioned that pre-show what are you thinking for that plateaued CEO that, right. like, hey, we got to make a big investment? Like, what's the try before you buy? Well, I mean, I think there's a couple of factors, and it touches on some of what you were bringing up. Sometimes as a CEO, you know, you're great at a lot of things, but setting your employees up for success may not be your skill set. You know, building out the standard ops, making sure they know what you do in your business, you know, supporting them in their journey. You don't necessarily have time or that's not your strength. And so when you make a hire, even if they're great hire, they're not always set up for that success. And that I see that time and time happen. The other thing I see CEOs do often is they don't really know what they need or want, right? And I think with our model, you have such seasoned people who have been inside so many different companies that they know how to get in with very little instruction, very mm-hmm. little support and make it happen. She just told me that I put people in with very little no. instruction. Support. <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> yes, but you, you are. <laughs> no, I was thinking more about the other companies. We dive in to our companies head first and we figure it out whether they are, whether they have it figured out or not, we figure it out. And I think that's a different dynamic than when you hire an employee, right? Very much. And, and I think the other, Other thing about the try before you buy, let's be honest, when you work side by side an executive, that's a very personal relationship and, you know, values and culture and all that stuff you want to align and it's your baby, right? As a CEO, what you have built, that is your baby. And 
you, you know, you have to make sure that person coming in who is going to be your confidant, who is really driving where your company is going, that you align with them. And a lot of times, just like dating, <laughs> you don't know right away, right? You have that honeymoon period and it takes some time to figure out, is this the right person? And so with a fractional seat, I was going to say fractional CEO with a fractional CRO or CMO or what have you, fractional leadership, it gives you that opportunity to date before you get married. And I think that's really important. And that's, that's going to not only save time and money. Yeah. I will also talk about a quality of a fractional executive as well is typically these people, if they're willing to be fractional, they hear me out on this. (laughs) They probably don't need like full-time employment. They probably have done so well in their career that like now it's just fun for them. Right. And I know that a lot of our fractionals at house of revenue are at a stage in their life. I mean, many have scaled and exited, whether they were in the CEO seat, a CRO or a CMO seat, many of them sitting pretty, many of them like even joke around, like, I don't think a lot of us even really need to work, but like we're here because we love it yeah. and we were made for this and we have to do that. When you take that pressure mm-hmm. off of an executive and they're there because they want to be there, they're there because they're passionate about it and they're confident in their ability and they're there to just play and have fun. <laughs> that's where I feel like yeah. magic happens. And there's some pressure that sometimes when it's an employee, you know, when people show up from a fear base, that scarcity mindset, that's what triggers anxiety. And they show up like holding on to their job so tight that it creates the stress and pressure. And then they read into things that the CEO is saying or the other team members, and they're always on edge. They're walking on eggshells and it's like, yikes, you really show up as your best self when that's where you're coming from. (laughs) So I do feel like people that are hired in, into those roles that are in like that VP of sales, VP of marketing, or if they're holding on to their job like this and their job is their livelihood. Unfortunately, we all have that perceived self interest or perceived self agenda. We are all looking out for ourselves. Absolutely. But when a lot of fractionals, like, so it's cool because we get, um, people reaching out to us all the time on our contact us form, people that want to go fractional Mm -hmm. and their stories are awesome. And they come through all over the country and even people in the UK and some reach out (laughs) and they're like, we want, I want to be fractional for house revenue, but they tell me their story Mm -hmm. and it's unbelievable the success that some of these executives have had. And now they're Mm -hmm. just in this place where it's like, I want to associate myself with a company like yours. I want to do work for the segment of people that you work for, because yeah. that's where it's exciting. I'm a builder. I'm not a maintainer. I'm <laughs> exactly on right. scrappy. I need chaos. I, yeah. you know, I really specialize in this sector or I get so much out of the thrill of fill in the blank. And I feel like there's a special group of people that sign up for this crazy madness. <laughs> but like attracts like. <laughs> you're not going to find that no. quality and caliber in hiring a full-time employee always. Well, not only that too. And, and I, I, I don't want to speak in absolutes because there's some amazing <laughs> full-time course. employees out there. And I, I want to say that in a very kind way, but what I'm seeing with the type of executive that's attracted to fractional, sure. I'm seeing more of what I just explained versus the letter. Go ahead. Well, there's always going to be outliers. It's an often thing. Mm-hmm. Often this is what we're seeing. And I think some of what you're t- touching on is I'm so nerdy with psychology. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If your basic needs aren't met, you're not going to be able to operate and self-actualize, right? And be the very <laughs> best employee. You know, the other thing with what you're talking about, these people that you're bringing in as fractional CROs, CMOs, we've seen all these different industries. A lot of times business owners become so pigeonholed yeah. It's like you're in the weeds and in the thick of things in terms of your business. And it's so helpful to have that outside perspective and that fresh take. You know, CEOs' jobs are not easy. <laughs> and it's not that these CEOs aren't capable of doing some of the things we're doing, but we're coming in from the outside and working with you, right? And we have a fresh perspective and it just makes your life so much easier and it's nice to have that confidant to someone who understands what you're going through. Being a CEO can be lonely. Can and be. <laughs> is lonely. And a lot of CEOs will make the mistake of relying on their people to lean on and, and vent to, which ultimately creates a really weird dynamic. But I think... <laughs> You can call it any of my former employees. Well, I only know this because I've made all the mistakes. I've definitely done that. My former employer's like, yeah, Stacey, you've done that. But I've learned the hard way and eventually got there. And, you know, but you do need that person. And so when you bring in a fractional CEO, that person, or sorry, ugh, fractional CRO, that person, it's not so inappropriate to be leaning on them and to really be teammates in it, in the thick of things. Yeah, I also just am at the stage of my career and- 
reaching a level of maturity, I still have a lot of growing up to do <laughs> where titles don't mean anything sure. to me anymore. And they were always so important before. Right. And when I gave myself the CEO title <laughs> <Me> um, <too. laughs> five years ago, it felt like such a huge responsibility. I just felt like I'm not really a CEO and am I even deserving of this? And yeah. I got to grow into this role and figure it out. And thankfully, you know, I had an opportunity to do it. But when we look at the way people are getting hired into roles and how hyper focused they are on status and that symbol mm -hmm. and the and the title and, sure. and all of that, it is so interesting to see like what you're saying is so true. That CEO shouldn't be hung up on the title of who they're hiring. They need to focus on the quality of the person yes. and what they can do to take them to the next level because there's so much more value in somebody even being earlier in their career, sure. but who can play the part emotionally, psychologically as a res the support at the right hand of the CEO, because a lot of CEOs, especially founder CEOs are actually quite brilliant. Oh, absolutely. And wouldn't be able to do the things they're doing. They're so talented. Right. But the weight of the business, the anxiety, the fear, the emotional stress, it weighs them down. And yeah. when they get weighed down, can they operate and execute at the fullest yeah. extent? No, they can't. Right. And so the CEO, the founder, the startup CEO going into second stage scale will benefit more from surrounding themselves yeah. with people who can take some of the weight off of them that really unlocks their ability yeah. to be brilliant in the role. Because if they're stuck in a like below the line state of mind, they're very reactive. For sure. And how they're running the business and making decisions. And then also what they're exuding rolls downhill. Yeah, it does. And so if they're stressed, if they're uncertain, if they're getting short with people, if like other employees are seeing it, that's not good right. for the rest of the company. So interestingly, in our work, we've had five years now, we just celebrated five years, and we've had umpteen CEOs, I mean, over a hundred and some CEOs that we've supported over the last five years. And one common thing through all of them is that as their right hand, if we earn that opportunity to sit there yep. with them in that seat in full trust, we can lower their stress. We can get them out of the day-to-day -day of the business and we can put them back in the visionary seat. We can put them where they're whole and healthy. Didn't we just tell a CEO we this did. yesterday? Well, where she's <laughs> like, well, what do I do if you fully take all these mundane like revenue tasks <laughs> off of my plate? I'm like, well, one, you could... Go spend time with your family, which I don't think you've done in a year. <laughs> no. Number two, you could probably get some sleep, which I also don't think you've yeah. done in a year. Number three, you're so brilliant yeah. from a thought leadership standpoint. You're a pure innovator in your industry. Go innovate. Get out of the day-to-day -day in this yep. muck where you probably shouldn't be spending your time. Absolutely. Because you're not the right person for Well, and that's what happens between that getting to that startup phase of that three to five, we'll say, million mm -hmm. To the next level. That's where you will see CEOs just getting in their own way because it's just, they don't know. You've been putting out fires and being a super doer for so long that you don't know how to change. And having that person from the outside come in and support you, I think that's huge. Mm -hmm. And when people ask me, like, I want to go start a company, what classes should I take in college? What, you know, what do I need to learn? And I'm like, go do a lot of self work. <laughs> Because here's the truth in my opinion. At the end of the day, any skill is learnable, right? Anything is figure outable, good old Marie Forleo. But having the tools and the skills to get past what you're going to face as a business owner is the most important thing at the end yeah. of the day. That's why I think companies don't last because they don't have that ability to do the inner work to get past the really tough times. Or they don't have that right hand woman or man to support them mm -hmm. and get them out of their own way and have that trust where you'll actually listen. You know, I think that's the hardest part about our job. We do see some of the issues and what's going on on the outside, but we have to earn the CEO's trust so that they can, you know, that they buy into what we're saying. Because at the end of the day, again, this is their baby, right? Mm -hmm. And just because we see where it should go, it's important to earn the trust. Yeah. And I've actually seen a lot of small biz CEOs that surround themselves with fractionals for all functions. Sure. And I've seen it work extremely well, like fractional CFO, fractional um, um, HR person. What do you call it? COO or, or uh, C like an HR. What do you call the fractional like a, HR? Oh, good. Like now chief, my brain's blanking chief too. Human resource <laughs> yeah, officer. Yeah. A churro. <laughs> I would this love a churro weird. right now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is high quality radio. <laughs> 
the real deal. So good. Okay. There, there are so many different fractional executives. Yeah, COO. We actually have a good friend who's a mm-hmm. phenomenal fractional yeah. COO, especially for scaling companies. And they, these, these people are awesome. You get brilliance and you get compassion and you get that heart and you get that support for a fraction of the cost. Absolutely. A house of revenue, we do it 50%. So each revenue team gets two clients. I've seen fractional CFOs that have where they're as little as like one to two hours per month. So they could have 20 to 30 clients. I mean, I've seen fractional at that level. I think it just varies of what they're actually doing in the seat, how fully they assume the role, what the needs of the business are in that stage of growth. I think fractional is the future. I think fractional is here right now. I think people are adopting it. I think I've heard a couple of people say we might be heading into a recession. Super weird. Go Fed, raising rates. <laughs> but on that note. But a great opportunity to make lots of money. I mean, that's during recessions, that's when millionaires are, are built. Because if you can survive a recession, it's yeah. a whole different conversation. And thinking about COVID, you know, there's a lot of research to show that this fractional trend has really started because of COVID. COVID changed the game in the workplace. Yeah. And the way people work is completely different. And it's giving you access to talent you didn't have before. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of companies are capitalizing on it. And this is a real opportunity, recession or not, to make smart choices to really help grow your company. Yeah, I agree. So in summary, <laughs> the CEO skills that you have that get you through startup scale and into the early onset of second stage scale may be what actually hinders you in second stage scale because the same skills that chaotic being able to figure it out at all costs being able to navigate really anything and be so scrappy those actually aren't the right qualities when you go into second stage scale you need structure you need consistency repeatability thank you and building an efficiency like you can't scale chaos so the what was great about you through startup scale as a ceo founder probably actually is going to work against you in second stage scale. So it's the time to surround yourself with phenomenal executives. It's expensive to hire. There's a super high fail rate. There's this thing called fractional, go fractional. You get fractional CFO, COO, CHRO, CMO, CRO, CSO. I'm just going to start throwing the whole alphabet in here. CBO, figure that one out. I just made it up. So on that note, yes. what I would say is this is a phenomenal strategy for you. And do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, no, I think you nailed it. And I think whether it's house of revenue or another company, really being intentional about your hires and doing it in a way that works for your business is what's going to help you be successful. I agree. That's it for Revenue Radio today. See you next time. 